Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, new uh, video in which we continue reviewing the book What We Owe to Each Other by TM uh, Scanlon. Um, this time we're going to talk about the fifth chapter of the book, uh, The Structure of Contractualism, which is the most important chapter uh, in the book because it, uh, it develops like kind of fully uh, the ethical philosophy that Scanlon has been while well, defending in uh, the entire book. So the fifth chapter is about everything that you need to know in order to understand what is contractualism um, from uh, Scanlon's uh, point, uh, point of view. So as we said in the previous chapter, uh, which we already introduced this term of contractualism and we um, we gave the, the sketches, you know, for uh, Scanlon's uh, theory. So we said that contractualism for Scanlon means that morality is based on the reasons that we have when we do certain actions or hold certain uh, beliefs and that those actions, well, we owe them to others. So contractualism argues that we are in some sort of contractual relationship with other people and that contract says that we have to provide reasons to justify our actions and beliefs to others others in order to live together. So this means that an act is right only if it is justifiable to others. Now Scanlon starts by saying that you don't have to be a contractualist to hold that definition of a uh, right uh, action, that an action is wrong only if we cannot justify it on reasonable grounds, is something that every theory of ethics must accept whether contractual or not. Um, as, uh, as Judith uh, Thompson, for example, says in a footnote there, if you are a utilitarian, you're not necessarily a contractualist, but you still have to provide justification for your actions. So that justification for a utilitarian resides in the amount of pleasure produced. If the pleasure outweighs the pain, the action is justified. So this for the utilitarian doesn't depend on an agreement between people. If agreements would uh, decrease the amount of pleasure of the majority that can be uh, produced, a utilitarian can break or dismiss all kinds of agreements. But still, utilitarians would have to justify those actions to others. So even if you are into a morality that transcends all forms of agreements, that morality is still binding us to be in uh, some agreement with others just to owe the reasons for that morality to other people. So based on this, Skellen argues that uh, his account of contractualism takes the idea of justification to be basic, uh, contrary to other ethical uh, philosophies, like for example utilitarianism. For the utilitarian, the basic unity of moral, uh, of moral action, of morality, is pleasure. And so justification is a consequence of our actions. Like, I do, uh, I do an action, it produces a uh, it produces a reaction. That reaction is, you know, people ask uh, asking me why I did what I did, and so there I start giving my reasons. So justification is a consequence of an action, not its basic uh, basic unit. Okay, so that's in utilitarianism. For Scanlon, however, justification is the basis for morality in two ways. Um, he says this idea provides both the normative basis of the morality of right and wrong and the most general characterization of its content. So the content of uh, morality on this, uh, on this view is simple. Uh, it just states that um, what is moral is what we cannot reject on reasonable grounds. So the content of morality has to be uh, reasonable or rational to some uh, to some degree. Uh, remember the distinction between rationality and reasonableness that we saw in the first in the first chapter. Um, so anyway, so many theorists have offered this uh, this view or views like this one. Like the content of morality has to be rational in the sense that what we consider moral must be based on principles that we have good reasons to accept. Like Kant. For example, or uh, David Gauthier, or Gauthier, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, uh, John Rawls, Habermas, uh, Richard Hare, uh, all, uh, all are theorists that insist on the rational content of morality. For Kant, for example, you are, uh, if you, uh, uh, if you are, uh, if your morality, let's say, is in accordance with the universal law, then it is rational. For uh, Richard Hare, if, you are if your morality maximizes your goals that are in accordance with universal laws, uh, with the uh, relevant information about others, etc., it is rational. For Rawls, uh, if your morality is based on principles that parties would accept, e given that uh, 
um, they know nothing about their particular context or the places in which they were there they'll be born uh, behind the veil of ignorance as he says then it is rational and for Gautier uh, if uh, your morality maximizes cooperation with others then it is rational and for Habermas if your morality is not monological then it is rational now monological here means uh, and I'm quoting from uh, from the book the justification of norms requires that real discourse be carried out and thus cannot occur in a strictly monological form, i.e. in the form of a hypothetical process of argumentation occurring in the individual, uh, in the individual mind. So this means that morality is rational for Habermas if there was an open communication about it with others to settle, you know, ethical matters. It is based on dialogues and not on monologues. So monological is when you theorize in, in your head uh, that your actions are, uh, are moral, uh, but that's not how it's supposed to work. You know, you're supposed to have a dialogue with others to determine whether or not that morality is legit. So Habermas is the closest to Skellen's uh, views, since Skellen argues that morality is rational if its, uh, if its principles are on grounds that others cannot reasonably reject. Uh, that definitely uh, imply that uh, it, it, it implies that there, there has to be uh, dialogue and communication, like in Habermas, but the difference is that Habermas looks for actual ag uh, agreement between the parties, whereas Scanlon Scanlon doesn't go, doesn't go that far. For Scanlon, you can have reasons that others can't, uh, can't reject, but they don't accept either, uh, because they don't accept it and you go along with it a uh, anyways in uh, Habermas's model, uh, that would be considered monological. You know, he says, uh, the agreement of others reached uh, through actual discourse is not required, and when it occurs, does not settle the matter. In this respect, my account may remain in his terms, uh, in the terms of Habermas, monological. So Skellen uh, simply puts the requirement for morality on the fact that others can't reasonably reject that morality, and hence that morality is rational. It's not about universal laws or maximizing goals or, you know, veil of ignorance or cooperation or communication, but whether or not your reason can be rejected by others. But as we already said in chapter one, uh, rationality uh, isn't what's aimed uh, at by uh, Scanlon. All the theories we listed aim at rationality and uh, the most rational thing we can do. Uh, check again the chapter one. But <clears throat> so uh, because Scanlon's contractualism is more humble, let's say, uh, he's not concerned with rationality but reasonableness. So the starting po point of the structure of con uh, of contractualism must be uh, well, must be reasonableness uh, uh, and not rationality. So here again, we are going to explain more what Scanlon means by reasonableness. So why is it uh, better to ask what principles cannot be re reasonably rejected rather than you know looking for the most rational uh, thing to do? So instead of principle that cannot be rationally rejected, Scanlon is proposing uh, principles that cannot reasonably be rejected. So we need first to understand uh, what is meant by rationality. And so first the term, uh, first the term rationality is mistaken for Scanlon because we often understand it as what contributes to the fulfil uh, full, uh, fulfillment of my goals. And so by contrast, reasonableness uh, is taken to mean, quote, a certain body of information and a certain range of reasons which are taken to be relevant and goes on to make a claim about what these reasons, properly understood, in fact support. So these two distinctions uh, became uh, became clear in the will, will become clear in the following example. Um, suppose that you are negotiating about water supply and uh, and water control in your country, but most of the water is owned by one landowner. Okay, so suppose that this landowner is generous and is willing to provide water from uh, from his wells to those who need it, uh, but. Uh, but this but this landowner has a temper. Uh, since there is no power to coerce him into giving his water to the community, we can only count on his generosity, right? But 
the generosity uh, is well conditional it depends on his temper if he's irritated or angry or has beef with some people he can refuse to provide them with water and so in this scenario the community is going to have to always be careful not to contradict or anger the landowner if they want to survive and so here the difference between reasonableness and rationality is well what is reasonable is to claim that each person is entitled to some water for survival, for hygiene, for cleaning, etc. And that it's unreasonable for one person to own most of the water supply and refuse to provide for others. But it is rational, uh, what is rational is to comply with the land owner since contradicting him will uh, will go against our interests and results in a worst uh, in a worse outcome for everyone so what is rational for the land owner is to keep the water since that serves his interests but it's not reasonable and likewise what is rational for the community is not to angry the land owner so we can say that this distinction is sometimes obscure and, and needless we can argue that uh, instead um, that what is rational is comparing the different interests and see which interests are more rational than the other on uh, the interests of the community would seem to overweigh uh, those of the landlord but this would be more like looking for the best strategy to fulfill one's interests because what's uh, going to determine which interests are more rational relies on how you present those interests uh, and so this will inevitably run the risk that you know some some people will try to uh, naturalize their interests making it seem that their own interests are more rational than those of others and therefore everyone should have the same interests as uh, as well if some interests are more rational than others then it means that everyone should adopt the same interests regardless uh, regardless of context circumstances or the differences okay but we are not in that kind of situation in reality you know people have different interests and therefore they have different principles okay so rationality only stipulates that everyone should try to fulfill their interest as much as they can the landlord uh, the land owner can use his power to uh, to get the consent of the people uh, to let him own the water supply he doesn't have to think about you know what kind of objections they uh, the community can raise because if uh, if, uh, if he does, if he thinks about those objections, he won't have reasons to claim ownership of the water anymore. So instead, he'll look for the best strategy to promote his interest. Uh, that is what's rational to do, promote my interests, which always end up with a homo, uh, homogeneous, uh, homo uh, genization of, uh, well, of, of interest. You know, the landowner will always have the advantage as long as he controls the water supply to make his interest more rational as those who don't have access to the water. So it is better to follow Scanlon and admit that that there can be no definitive answer to uh, conflicts of interest and so uh, there cannot be uh, a most rational thing to do so uh, framing the problem through uh, reasonableness seems wiser seems more you know pragmatic and even more realistic uh, when we go with reasonableness we uh, we would have substantial substantial judgments about right and wrong meaning judgment that uh, that take into consideration the concrete situations of people uh, the example of water rights once uh, once we look at it through uh, reasonableness, uh, when we say that it's not unreasonable for the population to, dem to, uh, to demand better terms uh, than what the landowner is offering, we're making a substantive claim, one that argues for mutual recognitions, uh, recognitions and uh, accommodation of both parties, not about what would advance best uh, their interests or about an agreement in an ideal abstract situation. So ethics always depend on the circumstances uh, of, uh, of actions huh? first. Uh, like we said before, what's right to do in one kind of circumstances can be wrong in another. So um, what we need to do is to identify which principles uh, make which actions right in which circumstances. Like something has to decide whether or not action X is right in circumstance C. Uh, and so our job is to analyze that principle and see if we can reject it or not. So 
One way to do this is to quote, form an idea of uh, the burdens that would be imposed on some people in such situation if others were permitted to do X. So uh, here we ask, is the uh, ownership of the water supply is, uh, uh, is you know, uh, is right? I mean, is it, is it per permitted? Well, we ask, uh, does it impose a burden on others if the landowner acquires the water source? And the answer is obviously yes. So we can object to that permission. Okay, should we permit the landowner to uh, to own the water supply while giving the burden that it imposes on the rest of the community? Well, the answer is no, we cannot permit it because it imposes a huge burden. But we also need to see if denying the permission to do X imposes also a burden on other people. So we have objections to, per, to permission and to prohibition. We can object to, uh, to permitting the action or to prohibit it. If, uh, if those who are going to be b burdened are the landowners and their burden is insignificant compared to those who won't have access to the water supply, we can conclude that prohibiting the act of owning the water supply is more reasonable. Uh, you know, when, when you pro prohibit the owner ownership of the, of the water supply is more reasonable than permitting it. So we have objections to permitting ownership of the water supply, but we don't have objections to prohibiting it. So, uh, so here we would conclude that any principle that permits a landowner to own a water supply in a community is rejectable and is therefore wrong. Co uh, case closed. Uh, because well, don't uh, don't uh, don't because you know don't own water supplies when there are many people who depend on it. Okay, this of course would be allowed in situations where no one depends on that water supply except except you. In that circumstances, you can own it, but we're not uh, but we're not in that situation. Okay, there, there, there are many people who depend on the water, not just you, so you cannot own it. Well, case case closed. But we're not out of the water yet. Pun. Uh, this works only because the permission and prohibition are comparable. We just compare the burdens and concluded that some will be more burdened than others. But it's not always the case. We can often face situations in which burdens are equally bad on both sides. Um, consider, uh, to stay with water examples, that you have two people drowning but only one uh, life jacket available. Obviously, uh, they cannot both have it. One of them is going to have to drown. Uh, what do they do in that situation? Do they take the jacket by force from the other? Uh, in this situation, would the act of killing be permitted or still prohibited? Uh, what principle can justify either one of these two options? So. The problem is that here, uh, for every uh, principle that can uh, reject permission, another can reject prohibition. Um, but uh, Scanlon argues not necessarily. What seems uh, aporic in this example, uh, what seems, you know, uh, uh, like a dead end, uh, is that we're only asking the question of rightness on quantitative grounds. Uh, we say that if it is going to produce more burden uh, we uh, prohibit but it doesn't ask how to permit or to uh, prohibit the burden in the case of uh, of the shipwreck um, it's true that both parties face the same cost in terms of quantity both uh, face a huge cost of losing their lives uh, if uh, one doesn't take the jacket he'll drown and if the other has the ja uh, the jacket taken from him he'll die too but as canon says the strength of a person's objection to a principle is not determined solely by the difference that the acceptance of that principle would make to that person's welfare so in other words if one already has the jacket or reached the jacket before the other the fact that he has the jacket will play a role in assessing the morality of the situation the fact that i now have the jacket and that i'm not uh, i am not at risk anymore can be a strong element in my reasons for prohibiting the other uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other guy to take the jacket from me and refuse uh, permission for him to take it. 
So the other person can think uh, the same. Uh, the fact that he doesn't have the jacket can also be reason for him to permit taking it away from me. Uh, but uh, this still isn't uh, about, you know, comparative and quantitative judgments. In both cases, whether he takes it or not, the principle, uh, the principle used won't be rejected when presented to others. You know, uh, the only scenario in which the uh, the principle I, I use to justify objecting to his actions can be rejected uh, is if uh, there were better alternatives available that would uh, that would have saved us both. Uh, so, in uh, in case there weren't, uh, then when uh, there uh, there are only two reasonable uh, claims clashing, we just go along with them. And then uh, whatever the outcome, the principles won't be rejected by others who demand justification for why taking the jacket by force or letting the other uh, drown, you know, uh, happen. Okay, so uh, if, you know, I don't let the other person take my, uh, my jacket and they drown when, you know, when I'm saved and when I'm in front of other people, well, uh, I'm going to give, you know, my reasons and they cannot, uh, they cannot reject to those reasons. But it's the same thing if, uh, if, you know, the other person took the jacket by force and I drowned uh, when he's faced with others, what he gives his reason, well, I didn't have the jacket, I was going, I was going to, uh, to drown and they won't, uh, won't, object, uh, won't object to it. So, uh, there is, however, another issue at play here. Uh, someone can object that, uh, um, that Scanlon's account suffers from some kind of circularity. Uh, if I'm looking for the appropriate principle to justify my reasons for, uh, for actions, someone can say what, justify, uh, what justifies choosing uh, that particular principle if not my reasons, right? Like, if I need principles to justify reasons, I will also need reasons to justify principles. So my principles are already moral, you know? And so remember that uh, the point of principles uh, is to show the moral reasons that we, uh, that we have. So the principles reveal what is reasonable to do, but to find those principles, we certainly have to apply reasonableness, like what principles are reasonable to choose in order to determine what is reasonable to do. And so we have, uh, we have to find moral principles which means, quote, by basing itself on reasonableness, it may be charged, like the, th the theory of Scanlon, it may be charged, a theory builds, uh, uh, builds in uh, moral elements at the start. At the start, sorry. This makes it easy to produce a theory which sounds plausible, but such a theory will tell us very little since uh, everything we are to get out of it at the end we must put, uh, put in at the beginning as part of the moral content of reasonableness. So we need to address this problem and it starts with cl clarifying what we mean by principles. So, from the start, principles are the backbones of reasons, okay? So, to, to determine if an action is right or wrong, we ask for the reasons behind it, and then we judge whether those reasons can be uh, disallowed by principles that can't be uh, rejected. Uh, for example, uh, if, I, uh, if we ask, uh, to go back to the water supply example, um, can you reject the principle everyone has the right to access sources of water? No? Well then, sorry, but your reasons for owning the water supply are rejected. Now, do you have a principle that can justify your reasons for owning the water supply? Oh, yes, you do? Okay, which one it is? Hmm, private property is an, un, uh, un, uh, an uh, unalien <laughs> unalienable right. Um, okay, so can anyone reject to uh, the principle, oh, someone can, all right then, sorry sir, but your principle isn't sufficient to justify your reasons. Now, these verdicts are only effective if uh, there was indeed a justification. When I say, oh, someone can, I mean that someone has provided a justification for why the principle cannot be uh, sufficient for justifying those reasons, all right? So, in other words, I'm justifying why your justification is wrong, okay? If I, if I cannot do that, then your justification is right. But uh, we... Uh, but we see the, pr the process clearly. Principles are here to justify our reasons for actions. Uh, and in turn, we have to justify whether or not those principles actually do justify our reasons for actions. If an, if an action has 
uh, principles that back it up and no one can reasonably reject that principle, then the action is right. If we can reject the principle, then it is wrong. So an action isn't wrong like that, but wrong for some reason. Okay, in this sense, moral judgments uh, are not like aesthetic judgments. Uh, moral judgments are about whether some action is right and wrong, and right and wrong function uh, differently from aesthetic values, like, uh, for example, beauty. When I say that a painting is beautiful, I can say that I see the beauty. I can then explain what is beautiful about the painting, but in that case, the explanation, the reasons that... Um, uh, the reasons why I see the painting as beautiful comes after I see the painting's beauty. Uh, I can, you know, supply an explanation for uh, aesthetic values, but I cannot do that with, uh, with moral judgments. Um, whereas I can see the beauty of a painting without having reasons for seeing uh, the beauty prior to see in it, I cannot see that an action is wrong without already having a reason for why it is wrong, right? So moral judgments cannot be relative huh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense of we don't have to justify them. Uh, what is funny for someone uh, or in uh, one culture won't be funny in another. Different standards about humor or beauty don't require justifications unless they become, you know, involved in morality. Like when the beauty standards put too much pressure on or excludes unfairly some, uh, some people and uh, and it's okay that we have difficulty, you know, articulating aesthetic judgments since uh, the stakes in aesthetic judgments are not re are not really that high. So as Kellen says, a person who regards a joke as funny or a person uh, or a scene as beautiful may be quite unable to articulate the standards, if any, to which his or her uh, judgment is relative. But I cannot claim that an action is morally wrong without having some idea what objection here is to it. And the idea that uh, Scanlon talks about is principles. A principle is what allows me to have an idea why an action is wrong. I know that slavery is wrong because it violates the principle you cannot own another human being. So unless you can object to that principle and prove that it is either insufficient or wrong, then then, you know, slavery is wrong. If you cannot, you know, uh, reject that principle, uh, slavery is wrong. But there is a problem here with principles defined as such. And that is, they are quite difficult to formulate. Uh, in the case of the water supply, for example, uh, what we need is what Scanlon refers to as, quote, a rule specifying what weight uh, one is supposed to give to others' interests when they conflict with one's own interests of a similar sort. So uh, that's what a principle would be. But the problem is that it would be very implausible for people to uh, be able to formulate principles about every moral situation that they, uh, that they encounter in their lives. Uh, if we uh, have to come up with principles that cannot be rejected by others every time, uh, we want to do something uh, with the belief that it's always easy to know the boundaries between moral and non-moral actions, then I probably wouldn't be able to do, to do, to do much, right? Uh, so, Scalin's contractualism, since it is based on formulating principles that, cannot, uh, that we cannot reject, seems to be implausible or at least too demanding. Uh, and so the only conclusion that we have to draw is that there is there's going to be only a small number of principles to justify our reasons which means that a lot of things that we want to do uh, well we won't be able to do them because well when we try to formulate judgments we make judgments that are too complex to be uh, you know captured in, in just one simple you know uh, principle, right? Uh, as Scanlon himself writes, if a principle is taken to be a rule that can be uh, applied to settle quite a, wi a wide range of questions with little or no room left for the exercise of judgment, then there are very few moral principles at all. And it would certainly be false to claim that every uh, judgment about right or wrong must be backed by one. So, uh, must be backed by one principle. Uh, but we can solve 
this problem uh, and Scanlon says that this issue is due to a narrow definition of what a principle is. Uh, Scanlon on the other hand applies a broader uh, definition of a, of a principle. He writes and this is uh, his definite uh, definition of a principle. He's, he writes principles as I will understand them are general conclusions about the status of various kinds of reasons for action. So understood principles may rule out some actions by ruling out the reasons on which they uh, would be based, but they also leave uh, wide room for interpretation and judgment. So Scanlon takes the example of uh, of the of the principle "thou shalt thou shall not kill." So it's uh, obvious that there are many situations in which uh, that principle can cannot be applied, uh, like in cases of self defense, self defense, uh, euthanasia, uh, soldiers in wartime. Uh, police officers on the job, uh, mm, uh, the principle isn't unconditional but depends on a lot of factors in order to become effective. Um, or what about, uh, for example, uh, the principle of uh, keeping one's promise, like clearly that's a principle that can only uh, be effective in terms of, you know, uh, a lot of conditions, circumstances, etc. Like keeping a promise is not unconditional. Uh, it depends on the person to whom the promise is owed, uh, the uh, proportionality of the promise, the conditions in which it was made. Um, if the things uh, if the things change, like the person to whom I made the promise turns out to be someone uh, to whom I don't owe anything, then the promise is is off. So in short, quote, so even the most familiar moral principles are not rules which can be easily applied without appeals to judgment. Their succinct verbal uh, formulations turn out on closer examination to be mere labels for much more complex ideas. So according to, uh, to Scanlon, this makes uh, principles like legal principles. Uh, the law may state that Congress shall make no law, uh, law uh, abridging freedom uh, of speech or the press, uh, that's the First Amendment. Um, it, may, uh, it may seem straightforward, but it lies on complex ideas that make that principle not, uncon uh, not unconditional. Uh, there would be cases where Congress can abridge uh, freedom of speech when it comes to hate speech, for example. Um, the issue isn't whether or not uh, Congress can do that on a whim. Uh, I myself am against the regulation of, of hate speech, but for making sure uh, that uh, those uh, whose rational speech that can counter hate speech have uh, either equal or more access to platforms, like you don't you don't censor right wing speech, you give more room for left wing speech. Um, but the idea is that you cannot take it for granted that the principle is unconditional. Okay, you have to be open to the possibility that there are cases in which Congress can abridge or censor speech. And even more so, there are cases in which it seems like cen uh, censorship when in fact it's not like the example I just gave, giving more room to left-wing uh, to left-wing platforms, for example. Uh, someone can say it is censorship or a violation of the freedom of expression of right-wingers. Why should the left have uh, access uh, giving to uh, giving to them just like that? You know, to the expense of the right-wingers who earned their platforms or influence, etc. Um, they did. Uh, well, I mean, they, they didn't, <laughs> but the point is that uh, this can only be done through realizing that principles are conditional and they depend on the situation they're involved in. Uh, so these uh, situations are complex, perhaps too uh, complex to be captured in just a fixed uh, few rules. Uh, when we make moral judgments, we're actually uh, shedding light on the complexity of the situation. Quote, in making particular judgments of right or wrong, we are drawing on this complex understanding rather than applying a uh, statable rule. And this understanding enables us to arrive at conclusions about new and difficult cases which no rule would cover. So, someone uh, breaking a promise isn't a simple uh, situation of someone violating a principle. It's a situation in which there are many factors that come into play and that can annul the principle of don't, bre don't break promises. So principles cannot be understood in, a, uh, in, in, in that narrow way. Uh, the reason why people would find it difficult to formulate principles is because they take a principle to be uh, 
to be narrow and, uh, and simple. But if we take principles to be broad and depend on the particularities, uh, the context, circumstances, conditions, personalities, goals, etc., then the problem is solved. A principle in uh, Scanlon's view can be like, uh, don't break promises if the promise is reasonable, for example. Someone who breaks a promise can't be morally criticized just because they broke a promise, but because of their reasons for breaking the promise. Okay, if the reasons are rejectable, uh, then you know the, the breaking the promise was was wrong. Okay, uh, and you know uh, and you know they are re rejectable because there would be no principle that can back them up. Uh, so if I break my promise because the promise was putting more burden on me than uh, than it should, or uh, because keeping that promise uh, to you is uh, hurting someone very badly, for example, like if I know something about a friend and my friend makes me promise not to say it to anyone else, like my friend is cheating on his wife, for example, uh, I discovered it and uh, may and he made me promise not to tell his wife, but. Uh, he's also a bad husband and he's uh, you know constantly cheating uh, cheating on her uh, yet his wife loves him and has hope that uh, his cold behavior towards her will change like i can see that me keeping that promise leaving his wife in the dark is bad for her and so knowing that her husband is cheating uh, on her uh, can be the information that she needs to leave him which she should so in that case uh, in that case, I can argue that, well, I can break, uh, break the promise. But if I break the promise because secretly I want to destroy their marriage so that I can be with his wife, for example, uh, breaking the promise is morally bad. Like, intentions can also, ha can also be a factor in many moral, uh, moral cases, you know. Uh, breaking, a, uh, breaking or keeping a promise depends on assessing the situation of taking the interest of others into account etc so as uh, Scanlon writes when we <clears throat> when we judge a person to have acted in a way that was morally wrong we take her or him to have acted on a uh, reason that is morally disallowed or to have given a reason more weight than uh, than is morally permitted or to have failed to see the relevance or weight of some contravailing reason which uh, morally must uh, must take precedence each of these judgments involve a principle uh, in the, the broad sense in which I am using that term. So by applying this, we are not limited uh, by the small number of principles because they don't uh, exist in few numbers. Uh, but it would also be wrong to say that they exist in an undetermined number either. Uh, surely uh, there are more principles that can justify our reasons or to, uh, or to reject them than we think, but there is not an infinite number either so every situation has its own appropriate uh, appropriate principles in this way uh, Scanlon counters the risk of letting people be free to use whatever principle they like uh, as he says we can see uh, the need for uh, limits on certain uh, patterns of thought uh, on certain patterns of action sorry uh, patterns of justification by seeing the ways in which uh, we are at risk if people are let free to decide to act in these ways and by understanding the rationale for these moral constraints uh, we can see what why it is that certain reasons for action and certain ways of uh, giving some reasons priority over others are morally inadmissible. So there can never be a fixed list of principles to justify or reject reasons because you know we encounter new situations every day in which you know all the principles that we know cannot uh, cannot apply in them so we are forced to come up with new ones but it doesn't mean that there is no rules uh, that there are no rules to uh, in how to come up uh, with uh, with principles uh, that anyone can come up with a principle and no one can object to them no there are uh, there are ways there are methods to arrive at that so on the contrary um, these you know uh, activities are collective endeavors and so we need to be able to incorporate different uh, different people's uh, interests into uh, the search we need to re uh, recognize and acknowledge the differences uh, or the different standpoints of people and that is the next section standpoints so the principles that we come up with must be guided by uh, the different interests of different people. Uh, interests are basically standpoints uh, which don't uh, don't just involve uh, interest but also perception, cultural background, etc. So contractualism says that these are 
things we have to take into account when we look for principles that would tell us which ones of our reasons are legit and which ones are not, uh, morally speaking. Um, so we need to have a broad perspective regarding others. Uh, when we talk about others, we mean those to whom justification is, uh, is owed and those who may or may not be able to reject uh, reasonably our principles. Uh, again, uh, check the last uh, chapter about the scope of morality to know uh, uh, what, what category of entities uh, justification is owed to. Um, so this need to have a broad perspective in the sense of we don't just take into account the consequences of particular actions on those uh, people, but the consequences of general or systemic performances or non-performances of such actions. Quote, first and, for, and most obviously, widespread performance of, uh, uh, of acts of a given kind can have very different effects uh, from isolated individual instances. Slightly less obviously, uh, perhaps the general authorization or prohibition of a class of actions can have significance that goes beyond the consequences of the actions that are performed or not performed as a result. Uh, take the example of privacy here. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't need uh, privacy because people are constantly listening to our uh, phone calls or because they are going through our files, but because we need the guarantee that they will not do those uh, those things, right? Um, the privacy is uh, something that people have good reasons to want, and that alone is sufficient to make those reasons into uh, to take those reasons into uh, into account when deciding what to prohibit and what to permit. Uh, this is because it's important uh, regard uh, regarding. Uh, the relationships I have with others. Uh, in order to be able to provide reasons and assess reasons, I need to be in a certain relationship uh, between other people that have to be, you know, my, my equal. Uh, we need to be between equals. But I can only do that if the others recognize my reasons. Uh, uh, they can, uh, they are not, uh, recognizing my reason uh, doesn't mean to accept them. Uh, to recognize them is something different from uh, accepting my reason. Um, and so by recognizing my reasons, they too recognize their reasons to restrain uh, from violating my privacy. Since they acknowledge that I have reasons to want my privacy, then they also recognize that they have reasons to respect that privacy. Uh, if the principles that allow this recognition is not recognized, then my relationship will be heavily altered towards those people. Uh, this is not just about the consequences, but about the reasons I need them to have as well. I need others to have reasons to recognize my reasons for privacy. So Scanlon uh, appeals in a, in a footnote to uh, John Stuart Mill uh, again here, to, uh, who criticized uh, Jeremy Bentham's uh, utilitarianism. In uh, Bentham, uh, utilitarianism simply judges an action based on its direct action, its direct consequence, but Mill says that um, it is not enough uh, to be uh, a utilitarian, uh, utilitarian. For Mill, uh, you cannot confuse utilitarianism with, quote, the doctrine of uh, specific consequences, by which he means the doctrine that an act is to be judged right and wrong on the basis of its consequences or the consequences of similar acts if performed generally. So, um, what Mill has in mind is that when someone does something wrong, like someone violates my privacy, what we have to do isn't just to uh, punish or blame them, um, as that can send, you know, uh, the message that we don't care about the reasons the wrongdoer had uh, for doing that. Um, if someone breaks into my house to steal some money, uh, that's a violation of my privacy. But if the state simply throws that robber in jail without acknowledging that they live in poverty, that they led them to uh, drug use, etc., and so uh, no one fixes uh, uh, no one fixes poverty, then the robber isn't going to understand that violating my privacy was wrong. Uh, for Mill, you need more than just judge the consequences. When you decide that something was wrong, you decide uh, that uh, someone is to be uh, is to be blamed. But quote: In deciding whether they should be blamed, we uh, need to take into account the reasons that we should that we would like to inculcate in uh, people and have them uh, be animated by. 
Here we must take into account not only the consequences of the actions that certain reasons would lead people to perform, but also what it would mean to have people being motivated in this way. So I need to make sure that the robber sees my reasons for not wanting my privacy to be violated, but then that requires that he can see those uh, reasons. So I need to know the reasons he has for not seeing the reasons for respecting my privacy in the first place. We both need that uh, kind of information in order to consider ourselves equals. We both need to take into account our standpoints in this. So. We both need uh, we uh, we both uh, we both need uh, that information about what people value and why they value those uh, those things. Uh, we need information about what uh, Scannon calls generic reasons. Uh, generic reasons are reasons that we can all agree on because they are reasons that we all can have. Uh, these include reasons for privacy. Everyone can understand why privacy is valuable. Control over one's body to avoid bodily uh, bodily injury uh, injuries. To have assurance uh, assurances against risk etc. So to be able to put forth the interest of our friends and families before those of others is also something that we can understand. So a principle of radical impartiality, for example, wouldn't make sense uh, as it would go against a generic reason and therefore it's a principle that needs to be specific. You cannot apply it uh, everywhere all the time uh, blindly. Uh, such so such uh, principles um, would affect us uh, would affect us a lot. Uh, it would affect my relationship with my friends and my family if it is giving too much weight in our lives. <clears throat> As Kenan says, quote, generic reasons are reasons that can uh, that we can see that people have in virtue of their situation characterized in general terms as such things as their aims and cap uh, capabilities and the conditions in which they are placed. Not everyone is affected by a given principle in the same way and generic reasons are not limited to reasons that we uh, that the majority of people have so likewise such reasons can't always be appropriate for the rejection of principles sometimes uh, someone's generic reasons are insu uh, uh, insu insufficient uh, like in the case of a loyalty to a friend that goes a little bit too far or uh, when your privacy can have a detrimental effect on uh, on uh, just social uh, social causes like uh, during the second wave of feminism who popularized the slogan the private is also political. Uh, that slogan meant that some women would uh, would hinder feminist causes by claiming the right to do whatever they want in their privacy. Um, for a feminist who believes that what women do in their private homes has an effect on women in general because the private uh, practices can serve more the patriarchy uh, than you know than than, than feminism uh, the generic uh, the generic reason i want privacy can be rejected because uh, of its consequences on a political movement that seeks emancipation freedom and equality between the sexes so here uh, we have to decide which ones to reject the principle or the reason depending on the cost the uh, generic reason can cost the movement and the principle of equality and uh, emancipation. So we ask, is it worth it? Well, we're not going to give the answer here. Uh, we just give the structure of contractualism. It states that we have to take those factors into account, see what is the reason for wanting privacy and if there is uh, sufficient, and if they are sufficient to reject the movement's aims, for example. So the point is to show that uh, what we hold as moral isn't written in stones okay but we can uh, but we can modify it it can be modified through circumstances the standpoints of people their points of view interests tastes reasons desires culture knowledge feeling etc all all of these uh, sure make it difficult to find principles that can uh, that can you know uh, be uh, that can, you know, appropriately uh, cover uh, everything all at once in every situation in which they're involved. But when we see the cost of not considering them, we can have good reason to reject principles that omit uh, these uh, these considerations. Um, 
when we uh, when we don't consider these things, we often uh, we often can take the risk of letting our biases guide us. And the last thing that you want when it comes to morality, because we're talking about people's lives here, is that uh, your biases uh, guide you in uh, taking decisions that affect heavily other people. Again, feminists know this very very well. Uh, patriarchal uh, biases in morality, the fact that men have uh, used a moral framework that puts uh, that puts for their interest while neglecting the interest of their sexual counterpart had you know disastrous effects on uh, on women so uh, biases uh, obscure uh, from uh, they, they basically obscure from you uh, the other things that you have to take into account uh, even if it's going to make it a bit challenging for you to decide what's right and wrong well you have to take many other things into account Quote, some of the most common forms of moral bias involve failing to think of various points of view which we have not occupied, uh, under underestimating the reasons associated with them and overestimating the costs to, uh, to us of accepting principles that recognize the force of those reasons. So, moral theory, such as contractualism, tries to correct those biases by making us aware of them, by making us aware of other people's standpoints. Uh, this awareness makes it challenging for us to provide reasons that cannot be rejected, but for Scanlon it's actually a good thing. Struggling to find reasons and principles that others can't reject is how you correct your biases. Well, it is demanding, but morality is demanding. We can be afraid that the fact that it is demanding will make us seem as monsters, but the fact that morality is demanding doesn't necessarily mean that people will be uh, more judgmental towards us, but uh, they can be more compassionate as they too would know that it's very difficult to be, uh, to be a good person. Uh, so the fact that morality is demanding can be grounds for good reasons to, to, uh, to, uh, to present when someone fails at being moral and others that, that others can help them overcome uh, their failures instead of blaming them for failing. Like, uh, a demanding morality is not necessarily an invitation for uh, moral crusades, but for the opposite, for moral compassion. Uh, so, this is why morality should be uh, grasped more as a process, like Skellen uh, relies in, uh, in a footnote on Habermas again, who says that morality is about a real process of argumentation, like people have to participate in that process, a process, uh, a process that, can, uh, that can never be over, of course, because, quote, nothing uh, better prevents others from uh, perspectively distorting one's own interests than actual participation. So, because this is an open process, well, no one can hold, uh, no one can be held accountable, sorry, for not knowing the ultimate morality, since there is no absolute theory of morality. The fact that morality demands to be a process of participation is proof that we will make mistakes, and that's why we need as much as possible to make everyone partake into uh, in uh, in uh, in the process to uh, correct or prevent those distortions that Habermas warns about in uh, in the quote just uh, you know, just quoted <laughs> uh, and as Kenan says I doubt that there is uh, that it is possible for theory to correct biases in a more radical way by specifying once and for all what the outcome of this process should be, for example, by specify, specifying in advance the terms in which all reasonable rejections must be defended. So, if we take uh, into account people's standpoints, we need to address an obvious issue, which is uh, the issue of fairness. Given that people have different interests and perspectives, it would be implausible to use radical impartial principles. If someone doesn't need mutual aid, uh, mutual aid um, they'll have less reason than someone who needs it to support mutual aid and more reasons to oppose it if they are obliged to help others. In this sense, someone who doesn't need mutual aid would see it unfair that they have to pay taxes to fund schooling programs in poor neighborhoods, for example. So, this is about the degree to which individuals can benefit from a principle. A uh, libertarian doesn't benefit from mutual aid principle, whereas someone like uh, John Rawls would benefit from it. 
uh, Rawls is the guy who theorized the veil of ignorance. Um, basically, before we are born, we are ignorant of the conditions in which we'll be, uh, we'll be born uh, into or have to live. So we need to make sure that people won't be left out because of their circumstances. A libertarian, for example, would, would not want this, wouldn't consent to this. Since they claim not to need mutual aid, they see that there is no reason for them to consider the plight of those who need it. The fortunate, uh, the fortunate ones don't have reason to care, reasons to care about the reasons of the unfortunate, if you want. So, this is one of the three ways we can look at, uh, at this... Um, at this issue, um, uh, the issue of, uh, of which benefit is relevant when we justify a principle. Now, obviously, Scanlon's contractualism rejects this first way of looking at, uh, at the issue, since we already established that you have to take uh, account of the reasons of others. So, the issue of fairness is going to be the one we, uh, we take those reasons into account, not whether or not we take them at all. So, this is the second way. An example would be asking if the, uh, let's say, the fortunate Jonases, uh, that's how Scanlon uh, refers to uh, libertarians in this passage, uh, like, should they take other uh, people's reasons into account by comparing the cause that uh, principle, uh, the cause that the, that principle has on them, on the Jonases with the cost, uh, with the cost and benefits uh, the principle would have on others. Like, if the if the principle benefits others more than it costs me, then I have no reason to oppose it, right? Um, so, um, what uh, that would be too complicated and uh, unnecessary. Instead, we need something precise to determine if we reject or not the principle. So, uh, there is a third way uh, here which Scanlon describes as follows. He says, all we need to take into account in deciding whether a principle uh, could reasonably be rejected uh, are such things as the following. A. The importance of being able to get aid should one need it, b. The degree of inconvenience involved in uh, giving it uh, should one be called upon to do so, c. The generic cost of having a standing policy of giving aid in the uh, way this principle requires, and d. The generic uh, benefits of having others have this policy. So. Determining the importance of receiving aid should be pretty uh, convincing. Any uh, principle that considers receiving aid unimportant can easily be rejected. B and C are about uh, the degree of inconvenience that is acceptable to give aid and that can be balanced by D, which is about the guaranteed benefits that people have through this policy. So this makes it uh, pretty difficult for someone who even gets burdened to the maximum degree to reject the principle of mutual aid. So the landowner who possess the wa possesses the water supply uh, cannot really reject the principles that uh, that they either have to, uh, like, uh, like it's an obligation to donate uh, their water to those in need, no matter what their moods are, or can't own the water supply even if it uh, doesn't benefit them personally. So trying to <clears throat> to find cases in which everyone would uh, would find benefits that are worth the cost would be imp uh, impossible. Even if uh, such cases can exist theoretically, Scalem doubts that they can exist uh, like in in reality. Like you cannot have a reasonable principle that systematically offsets the cost. As he says in a footnote, I am unable to think of a general moral principle of which this seems to be true. Uh, it is more plausible to think that particular uh, cooperative arrangements, such as a practice among neighborhood, ne uh, neighboring farmers, to help one another with their uh, harvest might make demands that would be too uh, onerous to be required of any, uh, of any except those who can expect <coughs> to benefit in their turn from the contributions of uh, others. So, uh, general principles can't accommodate uh, everyone in that uh, in that regard. Um, for um, 
for benefiting uh, for benefiting out of contributions uh, to others here parties will only have to rely on particular cooperative arrangements between themselves in uh, specific cases where a cost to contribution is too high it's reasonable for those who will contribute to ask for a benefit in return but those arrangements can't outweigh general principles of what we owe to each other in the example of the water supply the burden of the uh, landowner can't uh, make him demand uh, the cost of benefit that would in return put an even greater burden on the population than before. But nonetheless, the landowner can find some benefits in sharing the water or giving up his ownership of the uh, water supply to the community. So as Cannon says, in considering whether a principle could reasonably be rejected, we should consider the uh, weightiness, or the weightiness of the burdens it uh, involves for those on whom they fall and the importance of the benefits it offers for those who enjoy them, leaving aside the likelihood of one's actually failing in either of these two, uh, two classes. So, when deciding whether a principle is reasonable, we should consider both the weight of the burden it imposes on the uh, it imposes on, uh, on, uh, on on people and the importance of the benefits it offers, without necessarily focusing on the likelihood of someone actually experiencing these burdens or benefits. Um, this, however, leads us to a dilemma about how to account for. Uh, probabilities. Uh, if we reject a principle based solely on the burdens uh, it imposes, uh, without considering the probability of these burdens occurring, it might lead to rejecting principles with small risks uh, as strongly as those with certain harms. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we factor in the likelihood of experiencing these burdens, there are differ different ways to do so, such as considering each, each person's individual likelihood of benefiting from or being burdened by the principle. Uh, for example, uh, imagine a society uh, considering a traffic regulation principle. The principle states that everyone can drive without wearing seatbelts, and the society must decide whether to accept or reject this principle. So the burden would be that not wearing seatbelts uh, poses a risk of bodily harm in the event of an accident. The benefits would be that it provides a certain level of personal freedom and personal you know, comfort. So if the society rejects the principle based solely on the, uh, on the weight of the potential harm, like bodily harm in accidents, like there is a risk of injuring yourself when you drive without seat belts, but that's all that the rejection takes into consideration, like just the risk. Uh, then it would, um, it would mean that uh, rejecting a principle that allows a behavior with a risk, no matter how small uh, that risk uh, is is a reason uh, is as reasonable as to reject to a principle that allows behavior with the certainty that it will cause certain harm. Uh, so if uh, the society considers the likelihood of uh, of accidents and injuries, like how uh, how certain we can be about their occurrence. Um, uh, here there are only two ways to approach it. One way is to let each individual assess their own probability of being in an accident and then decide whether to uh, reject the principle based on that likelihood. The other way is to focus not on an individual's actual probability of benefiting from or being burdened by a principle, but rather on the likelihood that someone in the population will experience these outcomes. And so this is presented by the percentage of the population uh, falling into the groups of those who benefit or uh, are burdened. But the problem with this one is that it can allow for results uh, that are unacceptable, like we would agree to principles that demand that we put extremely unbearable burden on a minority as long as it benefits a majority, like by subjugating a minority to dangerous scientific experiments, for example. Uh, according to this approach, the weight given to rejecting the principle based on severe burdens would be sharply uh, this, uh, discounted because only a small fraction of the population would actually suffer these hardships. So this is obviously counterintuitive since we consider harm as an important and strong reason to, uh, to reject principles no matter what the harm may, uh, may be. Uh, so the only cases in which harm can be justified is that it happened by accident, like it happened despite all reasonable uh, precautions were already taken to avoid, to avoid that harm or minimize as such as possible so that the harm would be uh, 
reasonable for those who may experience it. We need to have scientific or medical experiments, but just because they can cause harm doesn't mean that we can't uh, we can have them. Uh, just as we agree that we need airplanes, despite knowing that they are, that they can be the harm that they might might fall on people. Uh, we are just you know confident that precautions to avoid uh, to avoid that were taken, and so the plane falling uh, on me is very unlikely. As Kellen says, the cost of avoiding all behavior that uh, in uh, that involves risks uh, risk of harm would be unacceptable our idea of reasonable precautions defines the level of care that we think can be demanded a principle that demanded more than this would be too conf uh, confining and could reasonably be rejected on that ground so um, so that's for uh, general principles that rely on generic reasons, uh, but there are cases in which individuals need to be recognized for reasons that are more personal, or uh, particular because we all rely on the distinction between ourselves and others. In terms of ethics, it's not enough uh, to be owed things as others, we also need to be owed, uh, owed things as who we are specifically right uh, we want to be uh, exempted from certain burdens not because everyone wants to but because that's a specific burden that we personally don't think it's fair to uh, to bear uh, but this always seems intuitively wrong uh, philosophers like Hare and Rawls they argue that uh, moral principles shouldn't consider proper names as Rawls says uh, they can only apply to general people or to particular people uh, but generally like we can apply universal principle to just one specific situation but you the person uh, with the proper name uh, simply you know happen to be in that in that situation so Rawls also uh, calls proper names uh, rigid the definite description. Uh, if we apply principles to proper names, that uh, then it means that if someone else who happens to be in the exact same situation as you cannot benefit uh, of that principle because the principle was designed for you specifically, uh, for a rigid uh, defi uh, definite uh, description, for you know a specific person that is you know John, and. So, Skellen fo follows Rawls on this. He says the question is whether the fact that a principle would help or hurt uh, specific uh, individuals can be a ground for preferring it and for reasonably rejecting alternatives that would have uh, that would not have this effect. I believe that the answer to this question is no, and that on the contrary, it is always reasonable to reject principles that are supported only by such partial reasons. So, first of all, we can easily rule out the cases where uh, exemption of someone from a principle will lead to a bigger burden on others. Uh, not only that, but the burdens that, uh, that result from principles such as mutual aid, whether you want to receive aid or give it, aren't sufficient to reject such principles. Um, so, if someone is worse off because you don't want to comply in mutual aid, like some libertarian, um, that, uh, that uh, someone has all the rights to complain uh, as someone who is the uh, direct victim of violence. But there are many cases where um, exempting someone in, uh, particular, uh, in particular from a burden doesn't negative, uh, neg neg negatively <laughs> affect anyone. Uh, think of cases of cooperation. When you have a problem that can be solved by cooperation, you first need to know how much cooperation is needed to solve the, the problem, even if it's a problem that affects everyone. If a problem affects 10 people, but it only needs the cooperation of three to solve it, then the participation of everyone involved is not needed. Seven people can be exempt, uh, exempt of that uh, of that burden, but those seven people need to be exempted through identifying them by their uh, by their proper name, right? So we can conclude that. Uh, so it might uh, seem that while each of us has reason to prefer exemptions uh, favoring us, none of us has reason to reject principles. Uh, Sorry, no, none of us has used to reject principles just because they include exceptions favoring others, since they are no worse from our point of view than a purely neutral uh, policy. But Skellen disagrees with this. He believes that uh, that we uh, that we do um, that we do have reasons to reject 
such principles and those reasons are that these principles are arbitrary they uh, they arbitrarily favor one person and thus are unfair the only way out is to make that selection not arbitrary uh, but also based on reasons that no one can reasonably reject in other words we have to justify why those seven people are the ones who get to be exempted from uh, moral requirements of cooperation. For example, if the 10 people are all alike, but we only need three to cooperate, we can pick them arbitrarily, but that's because they are all alike. So by making our, uh, so by making, uh, so, you know, by choosing them arbitrarily, uh, they are all willing to take on the burden if they are selected. Um, in this, uh, in this scheme of things, Scanlon says, we move beyond the particular wishes or uh, personal reasons uh, they hold, uh, that they, uh, the personal reasons that they, that, that they hold for not wanting uh, the burden of the requirement and, uh, and so we solve the issue. Quote, uh, they are thus not merely a way of responding to the understandable wishes of some people to uh, benefit in this way while neglecting the similar claims of others. So all of this is to suggest that some principles are beneficial to some while burdensome for others. If the principle is beneficial for you, you'll look for reasons to keep it up. Uh, if it is burdensome, you'll look for reasons to uh, reject it. But as we've seen, there are a lot of factors to determine uh, to determine if uh, you know, to determine what reasons are relevant for acting or rejecting a principle. And we don't always seem to know which ones are relevant in every case. Uh, some people would try to appeal to some sort of morality that would transcend those differences or some sort of prior notion of rightness, but contractualists say that there, uh, that there isn't. Uh, and so we have to deal with the uncertainty of moral values. Uh, this implies that the notion of entitlement must then be put aside when we apply contractualism. Scanlon borrows, uh, borrows from the philosopher David Brink, who, uh, who he quotes in a, in a footnote about this issue with uh, entitlement. Um, so this is uh, Brink, uh, this from Brink. Because these different moral theories are uh, the distributive norms that provide um, uh, accounts of uh, the foundations of moral and uh, political entitlements, we must examine their implications for, con uh, for context in which entitlements do not already exist. To do this, we must focus on uh, macro issues of uh, just uh, institutional uh, design, because this will explain how particular entitlements are generated, and uh, micro questions of allocating among individuals, none of whom has a prior claim of uh, special entitlement or desert. So, in other words, you cannot uh, justify a principle by saying that you are entitled to whatever it is that you think you are entitled to. Uh, like the landowner can say that he's entitled to the water supply. If the water supply belongs to him, he needs to provide reasons other than uh, that, that others can't uh, reject to justify that. So. This doesn't mean that entitlement cannot be a reason, it just cannot be a reason on its own, uh, like in the abstract. Uh, it needs to be appealing, uh, and for that it needs other reasons to back it up. Uh, after all, if the landowner doesn't have the entitlement to uh, the water supply, the community can certainly have reasons to claim the entitlement to the water supply, as long as uh, maybe they don't deny its access to another community that depends on the water. Um, we can say that well-being can be a reason for entitlement. Uh, I am entitled to something because my well-being would drastically be affected negatively if that uh, thing is taken away from me. And if that thing is something that everyone would consider desirable for the same reason, uh, reason as I do, and it exists only in a very limited amount, then I can claim reasons for entitlement. Uh, the example that Scanlon gives is even more appealing. He says that if I have to help others, like if that's the principle we adopted the principle of mutual aid in uh, order to help I have to be entitled to the resources of helping I can't contribute if I am unable to help if I don't have the means to help right but all of these are valid only in a contra uh, contractualist uh, setting that that you know that uh, that uses what Scanlon calls a holism uh, a holism about moral justification, or as he puts it, um, in assessing one uh, principle, we must hold many others uh, fixed. Uh, 
This does not mean that there uh, that these other principles are beyond question, uh, but uh, just that they are not being questioned at the moment. So. By putting aside the, the claim to entitlement in order to assess the reasons, contractualism means that although all claims and principles are questionable, like none of them are fixed, we can't uh, actively, you know, question them all and all uh, the time, uh, like the case of well-being, as we've uh, seen in chapter uh, chapter three, is pretty questionable. But there, but there can be cases in which you know questioning well-being is not relevant, and assuming uh, well-being is relevant. Put simply, uh, there there can't be cases with fundamental levels of justification. Well-being can be uh, cannot be a fundamental level of justification for at least two reasons. Uh, if it is, then we uh, take well-being as self-justifying, which obviously it isn't. Uh, if it is. Uh, I mean, so, sorry, if it were, uh, then well-being would be a special kind of moral value that, unlike all other values, like this this one, by some unknown force, is accepted of, of further justification. Uh, some can argue that if we don't have a fundamental level of justification, we run the risk of circularity. It is indeed a vicious problem in contractualism. Like we said, contractualism basically relies on generic reasons that arise from different standpoints, which uh, help us determine which uh, general principle is to be uh, rejected. But there, the charge of circularity arises firstly because what allows us to determine if the reason given in uh, uh, to determine if the reason you know giving is a generic uh, is a, a generic uh, reason at all, and secondly, uh, what even makes this reason able to have the moral weight that it has? Uh, what is it if not you know the principles it claims to uh, to seek? Right. So if someone says that the situation, um, you know that. The situation that they are in is is unfair but they don't have a fundamental level of justification like well-being then it's uh, suppo then it uh, then it's supposed that uh, they're saying that it is unfair without caring or experiencing a loss in well-being which is absurd um, it's absurd to complain about fairness per uh, per se uh, we complain about it because it has negative impacts on people but there is a reason uh, to this first uh, charge of circularity. We can say even though contractualism may have a circularity uh, problem, the, uh, the other theories we discussed in chapter three have an even bigger problem, which is they reduce all different reasons that people can have to a single master value, which we saw is more uh, unatt is a more uh, unattainable position. Okay, so. Again, check the, the, the chapter about uh, well-being uh, for further clarification if you didn't uh, see it already. And we also uh, claim that contractualism can have uh, unquestionable notions. Uh, it can appeal to well-being when it is appropriate. Uh, just because we don't have a fixed value of appropriateness, for example, doesn't mean that we are stuck uh, and all moral frameworks uh, come crashing down. Uh, after all, the non-contractualist -contra uh, objection is that we cannot uh, object to unfairness per se, then they cannot take uh, well-being as a reason per se either for justification. And yet they do. <laughs> so contractualism, on the other hand, can allow some principles to be taken per se. We say uh, we just have to uh, we just have to wait until uh, uh, until their turn comes up to be to be questioned. You know, like just for now, we can take something like we can take well-being for now and say, well, for now we're not going to question it. But eventually, at some point, we are going to question uh, how relevant well-being is in this uh, in this situation. But there's another charge of circularity which uh, claims that uh, taking the, uh, the generic reason uh, as having a moral force is circular. Uh, if generic reason allows us to know which principles to adopt, then they are already moral, so why need the principles and where does their moral force come from? And so uh, Scanlon's response uh, is the following. He says, the judgment <coughs> The judgment that any consideration constitutes a uh, relevant, poss possibly conclusive uh, reason for rejecting a principle in the context of contractualist moral thinking, as I am describing it, is a judgment with moral content. 
So the non-contractualist or the contractualist that are uh, not using Scanlon's version would claim that it is something like well-being that would give judgment their moral force. Uh, these are uh, claimed welfarist contractualist, if you want. Such accounts uh, would take uh, the following form, quote, it would have to begin with a clear specification of the possible grounds for reasonably rejecting a principle, whether this is giving in terms of a uh, conception of well-being or in some other way and with a sp specific a specified method for determining the relative strength of these grounds that allow us to uh, reach conclusions about reasonable rejectability without appeals to judgment. But here uh, Scannon argues that um, it is not well-being but any reason that can reject a principle in uh, moral uh, thinking has moral force. Uh, other claims, uh, others claim that uh, well-being does the job, but Scannon is just saying that why only well-being? Uh, why can there be other values to give moral force to our reasons? Uh, we've seen that. Uh, I mean, we've seen what happened. Where what happens when well-being tries to uh, take on that task? It's uh, it's really bad at setting the boundaries between itself and other values, which ends up uh, creating a whole mess when it comes to justification. Again, chapter three. Um, Against, uh, against this, Scanlon argues that we can, uh, that we can have substantive uh, moral judgments without the charge of circularity once we accept that there are other values, not just well-being, that can serve as reasons for our beliefs and actions. So Scanlon's account is different from the welfarist contractualist, although it has some holistic uh, dimension, like it tries to offer a unified account of its subject matter and tries to set out rules and methods for assessing reasons that can lead to a definite conclusion about what to include and what to exclude in terms of reasons. Uh, it avoids from the fundamental notions from the beginning, like this is the advantage of Scanlon's contractualism. Instead, it says that we must sometimes exercise judgments as to whether a uh, as to whether certain considerations are or are not relevant to the reasonable to the reasonable rejectability of a uh, principle since these grounds are not completely specified in advance so the reason for this is because when well, no theory can uh, can do that and we are going to stop here uh, for uh, for this uh, for this chapter um, Next uh, next week we uh, we will we will finish it because it's quite of a long chapter so I'm going to do two videos on it and uh, and so yeah, so I will see you uh, next time for the second part for this uh, chapter on uh, the structure.